Hello, and welcome to the Functionally Enlightened Podcast with Dr. Sharon Sarita. We interview well-respected medical and functional practitioners, as well as patients who have overcome disabling chronic conditions, such as dysautonomia, and reclaimed their health. These enlightened guests provide helpful tips on managing chronic pain and illnesses using a combination of traditional and whole body healing modalities. If you're interested in natural healing and quality of life improvement, you're in the right place. Thank you for listening to today's episode. everyone and welcome to today's episode. It's a very special episode. First off, it's our last episode of the year, so we're excited, but we wanted to finish this year off with a bang. And today we have with us Dr. Nakima Hudson, who's a licensed school psychologist. She provides access to comprehensive, transparent, and ethical services that uphold the development and interest of students' mental and physical and emotional well-being. It is her goal to break down the barriers and work to remove stigma related to special education and mental health. Thorough comprehensive evaluations give the opportunity to provide support using a strength-based approach rather than a deficit model. So Dr. Nakima has an impressive educational background to ensure that her clients all receive the best of care. She earned her doctorate degree in school psychology from Loyola University in Chicago, with an education specialist and master's degree in school psychology and a bachelor's degree in psychology from Florida A&M. And that's actually where we met in Tallahassee, Florida. So we go back a long time. Dr. Nakima also holds an additional master's degree in educational administration from Concordia University of Chicago. So thank you for joining us today. We'd like for you to introduce yourself a little bit before we get into the topic and also to let us know what actually drew you into the field. Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Sutra, for having me today. I am very excited to be here participating in this podcast. My background is school psychology and um, trained as a psychologist um, in undergrad. And that's kind of how I found this particular profession and particular area of psychology. Initially, I always thought that I wanted to be a clinical psychologist And it was through school at Florida A&M University and meeting with one of my professors who suggested school psychology. And at the time, I didn't realize what school psychologists did. And I find that that continues to be a common theme when um, speaking with other school psychologists. It's really such a hidden gem of a profession um, and that uh, a lot of people happen upon it because one, they love the education field. And they love working with children. And so that kind of meshes our opportunity to provide mental health services to students in an educational setting. But that's really what drew me into becoming a school psychologist and then really having just an exceptional training experience with particularly my internship in Chicago Public Schools at the time. And that really made me fall in love with the work. And just as I've been watching the profession grow and just the many changes that have come about in the 18 years that I've been practicing, there is just grown so much. So we continue to try to reach out and expose our profession to others to work to increase our numbers because sadly school psychology is, like I said, such a hidden profession that a lot of people are starting to kind of reach retirement age. And so It's just not a lot of training programs out there. So it's been a little bit difficult trying to grow our numbers as school psychologists. So we also started a project in the National Association of School Psychologists organization called the Exposure Project, where we are intentionally exposing um, high school students as well as undergrad students to the field of school psychology in an effort to increase our numbers. Um, So yeah, so that's a little bit about me, but I do love working with children so much. It's probably my favorite thing to do. My preferred age range really um, resides with six through, well, pre-K through sixth grade. I currently work in two elementary schools and one middle school and supporting the district that I currently work in. Very cool. As you mentioned, maybe not a lot of people are familiar with this profession and we see how you got involved. One of the questions I have for you, you mentioned your preferred age group. But we see that in today's culture that it's it's a much needed profession, definitely for school age children. I have school age children and I'm always concerned with, you know, their their mental health. So yes. can you elaborate a little bit about how you deal with the different age groups, middle school, elementary school, and definitely that high school years? 
Yes. So one thing that I I think is important to realize is that technology has changed so much (laughs) in the past several years that students have so much more and children have so much more that they're dealing with now because the world is so public and just the, the social media era, everything is online, everything is public, everything is in everyone's face. So, you know, dealing with self-esteem with students, dealing with bullying issues with students, these are things that weigh heavily on individuals. And a lot of times there's still so much stigma related to mental health that sometimes students access to mental health happens in the school setting. That's one thing that I say is positive about being a school psychologist is that we are able to provide those services to students in schools. Um, Sometimes that may look like social skills groups for younger students who might not have had as much exposure with other children, but need to learn how to interact with others. Um, So we are able to do that through social skills. Some of it may look like direct counseling with students, um, sitting down, talking with them, about what's happening to them and teaching them with coping strategies as well. I think that's a lot of times what we forget as adults, things we had to learn. We had to learn how to cope. And so we have to think about that when we're working with children. We can't just expect for them to know these things. We have to actually teach them these skills. And so sometimes, you know, we have to remind adults of that also. It's like, we didn't always know this either. But as time went on, as we grew, as we developed, we learned coping skills and strategies to help us even have a good level of emotional intelligence. So that's something that we have to work with students on. Once a student gets to middle school, you know, those are hard years for kids. Think back to when you were a sixth grader, seventh, eighth grader, and what that was like, even, you know, for us coming up. So just kind of thinking about how they are working on finding who they are and making friends still and trying to think, oh my gosh, I'm going to high school soon. What still thinking about what I want to do after high school. It's a lot going on for a young mind. So really, again, providing them with coping strategies and ways to uh, mitigate stress um, because stress is, it does a lot to the body. With high schoolers, a lot of times it is making sure that they're making the grades to be able to apply to the college they want or thinking about what their future may look like if they are not interested in college in the future. Um, there just there really are a lot of opportunities for students, but being able to also expose students to what is available to them kind of helps them out. But a lot of times they're also dealing with the young, young adulthood situations. And still, it, I mean, we're always learning and growing and just changing ways that we as individuals deal with stress, deal with our own emotions. And so that continues through high school. And that's what school psychologists are able to provide uh, alongside with counselors or school social workers if schools have those. Now I can think back to my own childhood and I come from a a broken family. I don't know if that's the correct term to use nowadays, Mm -hmm. but I remember I was pulled out from certain classes and I had a one-on-one counselor or something. I can't recall exactly the details, but to me, that was natural. I thought everyone went through that process. So is it similar nowadays? Right now, the way it is, one thing that's good about the school setting, like I say, a lot of times this is where students will have their first exposure with mental health support. And so, so there are some community agencies that will also come into the school and provide supports to students. But that's usually where our conversation starts. Has something happened in the student's past or in the student's life currently that may have triggered an event or triggered an emotional outburst or triggered something that where they look like they're dealing with a lot of stress. And so the opportunity for the school counselor be, to be able to intervene and just um, speak with the student is absolutely there. Not every school I've seen here has a social worker, but there are social workers in the district likely that an individual works in or lives in. The opportunity is there. And a lot of times parents now will approach us and find out, you know, what is available for their student, especially if they also see some things happening within the home that they might not feel as equipped to deal with. Um, and, And really working on strategies in the school that can carry over into the home is uh, of great importance as well, because you want to be able to carry those skills over that you have learned, even in the school setting. So that's a good point. A lot of people don't understand that there are things they can carry over in home. So Mm -hmm. what are some of those fundamental pieces that you work with clients initially that they can quickly embed it into their home life? 
I would really say structure. Um, I know that sounds very simple, but students, I mean, think of yourself as an adult. You know, a lot of adults like their schedule because they like to, to keep things organized and keep time. And sometimes that's something that a child will need also, or a student may need also, something to keep them organized, to keep them focused. Um, and we teach that in schools as well, because you have to think about schedules that students have. Think about turning in homework assignments, things like that. Thinking about setting aside time to study. So teaching those skills within school, those can carry over into the home where as students grow um, academically in the education system, at some point when you reach college, you have to be able to maintain your own focus and have a schedule and make sure that you know how to study. Um, so those are just some skills that you can kind of think of because as students, you're under your parents until the age of 18 and then you turn 18, you graduate high school and you're out in college and you're in this world all by yourself. And college is not elementary school or high school where teachers are on you. College is, you're, a, you're an adult now. So you have to really be responsible for your own actions and what you're doing to be able to pursue the goals that you have laid out for yourself. So those are just some strategies and things that we can work on or that we hope to carry over into the home. I mean, also, again, thinking about that level of emotional intelligence. I don't think that that's talked about enough. We really are trying to ensure that young people have the emotional intelligence to be able to advocate for themselves, to be able to stand up for themselves, to be able to know what they need in an effort to maintain a positive mental health, to be able to take care of themselves, to be able to recognize if someone is trying to cause them harm and walk away in that instance. On that note, if you have you have these school-aged children preparing for college, what about those students that are dual enrolling and they're already, maybe they've already taken, you know, the first two years worth of college credits, like the general academics, the English 101, I don't remember, mm -hmm. so long ago. Yeah. <laughs> No, but you're right. In that instance, I would feel personally just kind of thinking about transitions um, because they are students who have done dual enrollment and maybe entering college with an AA degree. So they may have two years left. Just really looking at what that transition looks like. I've had some friends who, who did that and who felt like once they graduated college, they felt like they went through college too quickly and never really had the full experience because they were so focused on their academics, because they were so focused on finishing quickly. So I think finding a good balance between anything that we do, we don't want to be too committed to one side that we miss out on an experience that may shape or define, you know, what we do in the long run that may, um, make other connections and build other relationships. Um, so I think really finding a balance, even as a duly enrolled student, again, don't just be so focused on the academic part that you miss the social side of things as well. Both are equally important. You also have the gifted students, you know, going through, mm -hmm. I guess, in the third grade, they, they start entry into gifted. And then going into the pressures of middle school, I have a son yeah. who's 13. He's in eighth grade and he's taking um, geometry, already finished algebra. He's taking biology. Yes, biology. Mm -hmm. So already you're thinking, you know, they're they're advancing. And you mentioned the social part, like trying not to leave that behind. And he likes to, you know, he plays football, but he gets so caught up in, in one or the other. It's hard for yes. them to balance. So how yeah. can you assist with them being able to balance that social aspect and, and not let those grades fall? behind. Yes, that can be challenging, especially in those intense programs or like AP classes and things of that nature. I think it again goes back to having a schedule, being structured in your time and being intentional with putting in some social time with your friends, realizing or recognizing how much you need to dedicate to studying and what part of that time you need to, you know what, I need to take a step back. I need to have some social time. I need to have some friend time because that's also something that's going to continue to really pour into you and help you to determine like, I don't just want to do academics all the time. I also want to spend time with friends and being there for your friends and having your friends be there for you really helps with the person's self-esteem, helps with a person's balance, helps with the person socially. And just, it, it really helps an individual to not feel so isolated because there are times where 
you're doing this work alone and your friends may not understand. And if you've decided, you know what, I'm just going to focus on school, school, school. At some point in time, those same friends might decide, well, you never want to hang out anyway. So they stop contacting you and that becomes an added stressor. So really just thinking about those important parts where I know this is important. I know this is what I want to do now. I know this is important for my future, but this is important too. I have to be able to have friends. I have to be able to have a community of people that I can, you know, connect with when I need to, because those are, again, are going to be those instances when, where you're feeling stressed, you may not want to, you know, talk with your parents about things. You need that community of friends to be able to talk with as well. So you don't want to find yourself so isolated and so hyper-focused on one thing that you neglect other areas of your life that you need to also be successful with. Mm-hmm. And that's my wheelhouse is trying to help manage stress, not in such a detailed way, but stress overall. So I look at stress as in what can you do in your lifestyle that's going to have you that rest time, um, yes. rest not being sleep, but that mental relaxation mm-hmm. or that that time to have some positive visualization and mm-hmm. uplifting, you know, meditation or whatever it can be. Yes. So that's, that's one of the things. And we always talk about balance. There's always a balance involved, whether it's distress level, internal stress, external stress. It could be with the age demographic you work with. This one is a hard one. The hormonal yeah. balance. Yeah. Yeah, damn. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, especially in those like later middle school, early high school years, that that's pretty much a day-to-day thing, very bio-individual, you know, yes. person can feel one way one day and then completely the opposite way. The opposite way. And yeah, there are, there are a lot of, a lot of hormonal things that are taking place. So you really have to be mindful of that. And, um, you know, not trying to impose how you feel on a particular student, but really listening to the student, listening to the individual, non-judgmentally. And sometimes you have to ask them in that moment, how do you need me to show up for you today? What do you need from me? They may just need you to listen in that moment. And that's what you do. Don't go in offering your advice or your your judgments or, you know, this happened to me. Um, There are different ways to relate without, you know, turning it back to you. So sometimes that may be how you start the conversation. How do you need me to show up for you today? What do you need from me as the listener? I think that's a a key point when talking with um, any students or any individual for that matter. And do you provide guidance to the parents as well? I mean, I don't know if you're working one-on-one with the student and is the parent isolated or? Um, So in the school, usually it's working one-on-one, even within the, my private practice that I've started be working with the student one-on-one, but there is a parent component where I offer consultation advocacy services for parents as well, where a lot, sometimes they do want a little bit of support in how they can better support their child in offering counseling services. Depending on the age of the student, there is built-in consultation component with the parent as well, kind of a debrief session. Very cool. What about the actual intake? Do you all select, does the school select students to provide this this opportunity with, or is it the parents that are approaching the school? How does that work? Um, sometimes it can be both. Sometimes it can be where a teacher will recommend that a student um, speak with the counselor. Sometimes it will be the parent. Sometimes it will be the parent who will come you know, forward and um, say that they're looking for supports for their child. And like I said, depending on what the counselor's caseload may look like, or if the school has a social worker, what the school social worker's um, caseload may look like, it may be either seeing the student directly or offering a, a referral to a community agency that works with the school. And I'm not sure if you can divulge a little bit more on what statistics are available so that we gain a better understanding of where support mm-hmm. is needed. Mm -hmm. I want to say that there is many schools, school districts will have information on their website as far as neighborhoods or particular schools, socioeconomic makeup. So there is a way to see that on a school's website or even on the state's website to see what the population is made up of the school, what the socioeconomic makeup of the school is. And that's one way that you can kind of look and see if you were interested as a citizen, what you could do to provide support to a school, whether it be educational resources, such as backpacks, pencils, things of that nature, you know, provide for the teachers, provide for the students. It could be contributing to a student's lunch. You know, just small ways that you can help out a school community for sure. Donating books, although right now that's kind of a 
hot button issue, so we won't go there, but but just thinking of different things that you can donate to. I know back before I moved here, one thing that one of our um, school psychologists in our district used to do is she would work with a nonprofit organization to collect coats for students because as winter time would roll around, students need coats. So that would be one thing that she would kind of do, obtaining coats for students who may need you know, warm clothing when winter time came around. So just looking at the district's website to see what the makeup of the population of the school is would be helpful. Everyone can look up their own school districts to review that. Now, you did mention you're working on a private practice as well. How did that evolve and what kind of cases are you taking on nowadays? Yes, yeah, so that evolved recently. And this was honestly not anything I ever saw for myself until I really started thinking about it. And I think that's one of the reasons that I, I love working with students. Sometimes you don't see things for yourself until they are there. So I did. I, I recently started a private practice. I was able to get licensed here in the state of Florida as a school psychologist, a licensed school psychologist through the Florida Health Department and started a psychological um, services business. And so it's called Better Together Psychological Services, and we offer comprehensive assessments and looking at students who may be suspected of having a specific learning disability, intellectual disability, students who you may suspect have autism spectrum disorder, ADHD. We really do work um, to provide those assessments for all individuals. We also provide counseling services. Those at this time are all virtual through telehealth, but those are available again for minors as well as adults. And we also offer consultation and advocacy uh, for parents because we recognize that navigating the school system, navigating special education, navigating mental health, you know, can be challenging. And there is just still so much stigma. And sometimes it depends on the community. There's just so much stigma related to mental health and special education. And so we want to break down those barriers. So that consultation and that advocacy is there to provide for parents. So those are some of the things that we're offering at this time. Myself and two of my wonderful colleagues, one who I trained with at Florida A&M, and another who is my colleague presently here in the district that I work in. But yes, we are excited to see where we go with this, but we are definitely here to provide support for students, individuals, um, parents, and just the community as a whole. With your private practice, is that referral-based also? Like, do you accept referrals? And also, do you work with other practitioners to kind of co-manage a case? We are referral. Our website is up where we also offer a... Pre 20-minute consultation, whether that is related to individual testing or testing for students or even with a parent trying to decide which direction they would like to go, whether it be with an evaluation or whether they feel like they need consultation and advocacy, that opportunity is there. It is myself and two of my other colleagues. So any of us are available for the testing. Two of us are available for the counseling, but all of us are also available for consultation and advocacy. But open to referrals uh, at this time, it's really kind of by word of mouth as far as working with individual clients, but we are open to referrals. Mm -hmm. I work with clients who uh, they are generally in the older age range, but they deal with significant chronic illnesses, some Mm -hmm. of them quite disabling, some of them not physically disabling, but as you mentioned, it can be what we call an invisible illness. So are you open to working with that clientele? Absolutely. Personally, having some medical challenges myself, I recognize the importance of being able to have someone who listens to you, who understands you, and who believes what you're saying is going on. I know a lot of times that becomes, especially with an invisible disability or an invisible health struggle, a lot of times people don't recognize that that's something that is real for an individual. And a lot of times that can slip into someone demonstrating a kind of toxic positivity attitude where it's like, keep your head up, all things are gonna get better, tomorrow's gonna be better. But in reality, you are really having a difficult time making it through your day. In reality, your your body hurts. And so, you know, with a person not being able to see that, but you know how you're feeling, you really want someone who is available to understand what you're going through and really provide you with tangible ways or real ways to deal with those issues and not someone who's going to brush that off. So that is something that we would be open to supporting as well. I think that's 
extremely beneficial to a person because I've been dealing with my own chronic struggles for years now, over four years. And in the beginning, it was just that fear factor from traditional medicine. We didn't have the support, you know, that there is somebody there to listen. Yes. That's key. If yes. you don't have someone, if people are there and they're looking to find a diagnosis and write some prescriptions and, and you know, see you in three months. But a lot of clients need a little bit more structure and a little bit more time together. Yes. For lack of a yes. yes, absolutely. How can people reach you if they'd like to schedule an appointment? You talked about your website, but if you can give us some direction, maybe they want to learn more about your practice. Sure. So our website is btpsychservices.com or you're able to search Google Better Together Psychological Services. We're also on social media. We are on LinkedIn. We are on Facebook and we are also on Instagram. Um, Those would be the best ways to look us up and connect with us. Um, You're also able to reach out to me directly via email. The email is drniekema at btpsychservices.com. So Dr. Nikema at btpsychservices.com. Our phone number is 321-413-8039. But either way, we are here to support and looking forward to connecting with any individual who may feel a little reserved with reaching out for mental health support. I know that can be a challenge in admitting that we may need some help. But if you find that you're stuck in a particular situation and you're having difficulty moving forward, that would be the time to really take a moment and step back and say, could I use a a little bit of help here? We hate for things to turn into something that really begins to interfere with your everyday life and really interferes with you being able to do anything or be successful with moving forward. So that's really kind of where your starting point is. Is it, how is this crippling me in my life right now? And this is not where I want to stay. I want to move forward. So that may be, you know, a catalyst for thinking I might need a little bit of help here. Absolutely. I appreciate that. Um, We'll make sure to share all of your contact information in our show notes. And for anyone who is looking for this, uh, Dr. Nakima Hudson provides this telehealth So that's an awesome opportunity to reach out. So this is for the state of Florida. Anyone in Florida can reach out to Dr. Hudson and and take advantage of those telehealth visits. So again, Dr. Hudson, thank you so much for sharing some time with us and for enlightening us on this yield. Dr. Sutra, I appreciate you immensely. Thank you for having me. Thank you, listeners. We'll see you next time. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast and also to our Instagram. Our handle is functionally enlightened. Dr. Sharon Sarita is not a medical professional and is not providing healthcare, medical, or nutritional therapy services or attempting to diagnose, treat, prevent, or cure any physical, mental, or emotional issue. The information provided in this podcast is for the informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek advice from your physician or other qualified healthcare provider before undertaking a new health regimen. Do not disregard medical advice or delay seeking medical advice because of information you heard in this podcast. Do not start or stop any medications without speaking to your medical or mental health provider.